TheActuationZone.com, brought to you by ChangeLeadershipGroup.com. Welcome to The Actuation Zone. This is Brett Clay. I'm here with Professor Hirsch Sheffrin, Professor of Finance at Santa Clara University and one of the leading experts in behavioral finance. He's the author of two books, or actually many books, but <laughs> we'll just mention two here. The uh, first one is Beyond Greed and Fear, now a seminal book in the, the domain of, of behavioral finance. And uh, uh, one of the latest ones is Ending the Management Illusion. Uh, thank you very much for your time today, Dr. Sheffern. It is my pleasure. Great to see you, Brett. So tell us, first of all, what is the, let's uh, you know, start broadly. Tell us, what is behavioral finance? So in a, in a nutshell, behavioral finance is the application of psychology to financial decision making and to financial markets. Okay, excellent. And then uh, last time when I was in your office, I think you mentioned that the broad term in psychology that, that applies to that is prospect theory. Is that right? Well, prospect theory is one element uh, that, that is part of the toolkit that behavioral uh, financial economists use to explain how people in general, but investors and managers in particular, evaluate risky prospects and make decisions. Right. So, so and, and I understand from studying the, the, the prospect theory a little bit as one of the toolkits uh, in preparation for the interview, that uh, people, if, if you look at a, a probability and an outcome, that people might, may, their, their decision on whether or not they'll take that risk, for example, might depend on whether the outcome is positive or negative, and that they wouldn't make a mathematically uh, indifferent uh, choice, but the choice will, it'll be, it'll depend on their own, some of these, you know, human preferences that are not, quote unquote, rational if they were just purely mathematical, but they're actually almost irrational because people respond differently, for example, to negative versus positive outcomes. Right. So there's, there's uh, negative, positive in several respects. So one of the things that prospect theory tells us is that when people evaluate outcomes, they don't look so much at final position as changes relative to some starting position exactly so we call it a reference point but reference it is reference point right exactly yeah and 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 so the location of the reference point uh, defines how you'll code an outcome so two people if they have different reference points one person who has a low reference point might be looking at a situation and think it's mostly all gravy right right and the other one and they'll be totally risk averse or risk tolerant then uh, because it, if it's gravy, I'll just take the risk. It doesn't matter. Uh, it, it, it depends on the size of the stakes. Okay. If, if, so if, if, I offer, if I offer you a chance at a sure $100,000 or a 1 in 10 chance of winning a million, and if you don't win a million, you win nothing. So the question is, how many people would turn down a sure $100,000? <laughs> <You're yeah>. Right. <laughs> right. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, but what happens is that people who set high reference points... Uh, then the same outcome as so that I with a low reference point might view to be actually quite attractive, they would, they would view to be unattractive because their aspiration level is so high in terms of, in terms of the benchmark. And, and, and people behave differently depending on uh, how they perceive the, the, the character of the choice they have in front of them. So one of the things we know that's particularly strong is if I'm in a situation where I have to uh, either accept a sure loss or accept a risk where I may have no loss or I might have an even bigger loss. There are our own psychological propensities drive us to be much more tolerant of risk in an effort to try and avoid that sure loss. Uh -huh. And we're much more willing, therefore, to, to, to gamble in the, uh, one of my colleagues calls it gambling for resurrection. <laughs> so, you think, so what you're hoping for is that, in fact, you won't have to pay, a, accept a sure loss and pay, pay a penalty. That's one of the reasons why, if you look at racetrack behavior, uh, people at the end of a day are much more likely to back long shots than earlier in the day, and the ones who want who go for the long shots are the one who are, who, ones who are trying to recoup after having had a particularly bad day at, at the track. Right. So I can see that that just. Uh 
there are many implications for this in management. So what are, what are some of the traps then that you could see managers are in your research that you've, you've documented even that managers get into by making these irrational uh, deci- or choices? Well, um, there's something called the sunk cost fallacy. Okay. And the sunk cost fallacy says that you put a lot of weight on investment in a project and the money's gone, you'll never recoup it back. But what happens is that if the project is over budget and you have to make a decision about how to spend money next, if you have two choices and one is kind of safe and the other one is riskier but it offers you uh, the potential to actually recoup some of that past expenditure, you are much likely to go the riskier route. So let me just, uh, if I could, could I just give you an an example from VP? (coughs) I'm particularly proud of this last book, Ending the Management Illusion. Not that that I'm not of of, of all my works. (laughs) Well, that's good, because I was going to ask you about the management (laughs) illusion, so it's a good segue. (laughs) Um, So one of the things I do in Ending the Management Illusion is to describe how a framework for addressing corporate culture and what makes for healthy cultures and what makes for less healthy cultures. Okay. And healthy cultures are cultures where the, the, somehow the managers and executives have, have discovered a way to mitigate or address these psychological pitfalls, like the ones oh. that we talked about a second ago with some cost. Okay. And in less healthy cultures, because they don't pay explicit attention to them, these, culture, these uh, um, particular traits become, I call them gremlins. They're flavors. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> they eat into profits. Yeah. <laughs> so what I do in, in the book is I took a handful of companies uh, back several years ago, and I said, these are the companies that are strong, and these are the companies that are problematic. Okay. These companies have strong cultures. These have companies have problematic cultures. And um, now, so... It with we have a little bit of time that's passed that's elapsed since the publication of the book, and we can we can kind of see how those how those um, uh, character did. exactly. So I'll tell you the companies I picked on. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> I picked on BP. Okay. I said BP was an example of a company with a very unhealthy corporate culture. Oh, really? That it was prone to excessive cost cutting. That it was pr- prone to taking excessive risks particularly in respect to the environment, and that if you looked at its rhetoric in terms of the environment, it promoted itself as being very environmentally friendly. Right, exactly, with the green colors and everything. But its actions were diametrically opposite to its rhetoric. So we now have, from this past summer, (laughs) you know, unfortunate uh, 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 evidence that all of these traits uh, played themselves out in a most expensive way for not just the shareholders of BP, and for that matter, the managers of BP, but for the entire um, uh, Gulf Coast uh, economy. No kidding. Now, uh, could I ask you just a little bit out of intellectual curiosity, but I think also this is maybe an important question for listeners. What, how did you gather that data and that insight into the cu- culture of BP originally? So what I did was, uh, I was uh, when I wrote the book, uh, I had a framework in place, and I had a concept of, w- of w- what types of psychological uh, issues might come up negatively in a company and how those might play out in a negative way. And so I've, when I, whenever I'm in writing mode, I'm on the lookout right, for right. cases. Right. And so there are a whole series of companies I would normally look at and ask, um, does this company situation fit so the question is, where does the, where does the actual data come from? It's all publicly available. Oh, okay. So financial press, if, it, if it's a publicly held company, it will, fi- it will file through, through Edgar, financial statements. Right. Uh, so it's, it's all there. You don't have to look far in order, to, in order to get your hands on this stuff. So it's literally from the, from the official filings? It is. The, wow. Okay. Uh, I'll give you another example. Uh, I'm going to give you a positive example in a second, but I wanted, I'll do one more negative example. I talked about UBS. I talked about UBS as a company that, that did uh, some things actually well, but other things were highly problematic. And um, I picked what I could from 
the um, uh, from the public record. Um, and this was so the book was published in early to mid two thousand eight, before the financial crisis hit. Right, right. Um, now, just after my book was published, I didn't know it at the time, but UBS released a self-analysis of what it had done wrong. I wound up giving a talk to a group of, uh, to an international group of uh, portfolio managers, analysts, um, and so on. And I discussed what was in my book about BP and I, uh, uh, sorry, about UP, UBS, okay. I, about UBS, and I placed it in the context of the framework. And I got this guy in the audience who came up to me afterwards and said, um, you must have read the internal report because because of, and I said, what internal report? And then he, and he told me about the report, which he then sent to me. And when I read it, I was just dumbfounded because what UBS did in their internal report to shareholders was to basically provide all the additional details that I would never have been able to glean from the, from the public information available. And it all simply, you could take each piece of information, you could put it into the various boxes of the, of the framework. Um, so that was, that was a situation that was, that was uh, particularly positive and, and confirmatory, uh, at least positive in the sense that it, 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 uh, the story fit the analysis. Right. But it was, it was an, a, a company with a, with a weak culture. So UBS had a weak culture, uh, BP had a weak culture, but I'll give you two companies that I thought had strong cultures. So one is Southwest Airlines. Okay. And uh, if, if you look at Southwest Airlines' record since the book was published, it's basically the top airline in the U.S. Right. Uh, if uh, another company that I looked at that was less easy to see was Ford Motor Company. Oh. So I said that because at that time, Ford was looked to be on the verge of not, of not, not existing as an independent company. Right. But they had um, hired a new CEO Exactly, from Boeing. And I looked at what he did when he came in to um, Ford. I looked at what he was going to do to Ford's culture. And you could just go through and, and tick, tick off the checklist. From your framework. <laughs> and I, Was he a client? No, he was not a client. <laughs> he was not a client. Uh, but I, I said in, in the book that this was all really to the positive. And I spelled out the nature of his plan that he wanted Ford to return to profitability by 2009. Uh, if I were to do an update, I would say that he did, that alas, he failed. He, he didn't, he missed that goal. And it happened because the financial crisis created the worst market for the automobile industry since the Great Depression. Um, but Ford did return to profitability in 2010. And do you know what? At the end of 2010, Ford was the most profitable automobile manufacturer in the world. The world? Wow. With a little bit of negative help, if you will, from Toyota kind of mess stepping on their own toes. That, 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 did, that certainly helped them. It didn't help Toyota. It, uh, so these things do happen. Uh, but, you know, non nonetheless, uh, that's, that's an, you know, an incredible statement. I mean, we are, right. I mean, there are, I mean, you know, no company's perfect, uh, but if you look at all the competitors, in turn, you know whether it's you know Mercedes or you know, Volkswagen or Honda, or uh, of course our own uh, you know uh, firms, uh, American firms uh, had a rough period. Chrysler and, and GE both had to deal with GM. you know right, GM sorry both had to deal with bankruptcies, uh, but you know nonetheless you know I'm, I'm uh, you know I can tell you that uh, you know the thing that is positive and by the way I should say. I was lucky. You know, there's a little bit of luck involved in making these calls. And I say in the book, you can do the right things. And what I identify uh, for these companies is they did the right things. But sometimes you can do the right thing and it doesn't turn out well. Right. You know, luck, your, your luck can be bad even though your actions are good. And by the same token, you, you, you know, you can do the wrong things and luck exactly. out. Right, exactly. Um, so, but there are enough cases in the book um, where you can kind of go through and see what I said, you know, in, in 2006 and 2007 when I was writing the book and how it all played out over the next uh, three years or so. Okay, okay, so now you've totally got my attention. I'm hooked in. <laughs> so how do I become good and not lucky 
in terms of managing my own as a manage as an executive a business leader my own um, tendencies to to uh, behave perhaps irrationally in terms of the decision making and the 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 probabilities and outcomes I'm looking at looking at it takes a village so actually the important thing within a firm is to get the culture right that's that's why the word culture is so critical to these psychological pitfalls I, I got to tell you I'm very surprised to hear a a finance scholar talking about or organizational culture <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a very interesting crossover. Um, I, I uh, I'll go I'll I'll go a bit stronger. Okay. Here. Okay. I think that business schools do a terrible job when it comes to integrating the different disciplines. Okay. Fair. Okay. And and so one of the things that I've learned is we don't educate business people. Right. We educate uh, we educate for functional competence. And we do have capstone courses where we sort of right. assume that somehow it will all come together. Right. <laughs> but, but, you know, it, it, we, need to, we need to do differently. We need to teach all the way along how you bring this stuff together. F even, even financial decisions in a company, they're made in groups. They're not made as, as, as one person making the decision. Okay. Oh, right, okay. But how do, we, how do we teach finance? We teach people to make individual decisions. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll give them a group project to do an analysis of a company. But we don't teach them how to make decisions in groups, how to make financial decisions in groups. And so what I try to emphasize in Ending the Management Illusion is that we need to take a broader view of all these types of decisions and think about the overall culture within which the decisions are made. Of course, I focus on the financial decisions because I'm a finance professor, but I'm well aware of the marketing decisions, the operations decisions, right. the accounting decisions, which are, are, can be a little bit different from the finance decisions and so on. It's, um, it's, it's a much bigger picture. So you it's, when you build a culture, you need to think about what the decisions are, how they're going to be made, and how people within the group will help each other to overcome the tendencies for bias and pitfall. Perfectly stated, yeah. You know, I, I got I to admit, I'm a little bit of a drinking the Kool-Aid here because, uh, you know, definitely going through your courses many, many years ago and, and a, a couple of other uh, professors, uh, for example, the, I think it was the econometrics class, you know, this whole I notion of cognitive biases and heuristics, at least going through Santa Clara University Levy School of Business, I walked out of here saying, I am going to try to maintain my objectivity and I'm going to be aware of the heuristics and I'm going to try to, you know, take those out of my decision making. And I felt so strongly about it that actually in my first book called Forceful Selling, I put an entire laundry list of heuristics that people should be should look out for. So recognition, it, it's kind of like a 12-step process. <laughs> And step one is recognition. <laughs> Admit you've got a problem. Right, right. Admit that you are subject to these heuristics that you don't even rec you don't even know unless someone like Dr. Sheffrin tells you. Right. <laughs> uh, and then uh, you know, uh, uh, step two is deal with overconfidence as an obst not just as a pitfall that can, that can prevent you from making uh, good decisions in in the future, but as a pitfall to taking steps to address your other weaknesses and vulnerabilities. Okay. And you know, so step, step two, and I am actually serious about 12 step, because step two, these issues are addictive. These are addictive behaviors. Uh, okay. And so you, the same techniques that can work to break down negative addictive behaviors, those techniques ought to work to deal with psychological pitfalls that get in the way because they're hardwired behavior patterns. Okay, okay, gotcha, right. So you have to deal with uh, what we call overconfidence, which is which is a particular bias, and it comes in two flavors. One flavor is uh, overconfidence about knowledge, where we think we know more than we do. And then the other one, which is particularly nasty, is overconfidence about ability, where we think we're better than we are. And a actually, c coming, that's sparking my memory of being in econometrics class and doing the random walk. <laughs> Tell me why. 
because people look at the their own performance for example picking stocks and they think oh look how great i did look how the i picked the stock and it went up but in reality you can just flip the penny and realize that's just a random walk and had nothing to do with with your with your knowledge that's right um and so if if you tend to um feed your overconfidence by taking credit for successful outcomes right <laughs> And And executives would never do that. (laughs) None of you would ever take credit for a successful outcome that you only happen to have landed on after the guy before you left. (laughs) Uh, Then what will happen is that you'll be selective. And so you'll grow more and more overconfident with time because you always feed your overconfidence when good things happen, but you blame something else or somebody else when, when things don't. Right, right. And, you know, that's where a little of this comes, in all seriousness, comes to some of the techniques that people use in order to play the political games, to, to survive through the, you know, the, the environment, I guess. Right, yeah. It's, uh, there's, certainly, there's certainly a lot of issues about how to deal with, uh, the, with office politics. Um, and, and I guess that, again, gets back to why you're saying culture is the ultimate elixir, if you will, or cause. It is. Um, it, you, the, you know, the culture can be built so that people have a... There are, you will never eliminate office politics. By, you, know, by, you know, human nature is just like that. But the question is, how strong will the political issues become within the organization? And, of course, some of that is circumstantial, but... You, if you build a culture to feed people's tendencies to compete internally, you'll get one set of behaviors. And if you find ways to structure the way you reward people and the way you provide information uh, to mitigate those tendencies, especially in difficult times. So that right, exactly. So you teach people how to work together collectively in difficult times. Uh, you'll, you know, what you find is that you'll sort of overcome um, the, uh, those uh, unpleasant periods, uh, you'll be able to cope better. The whole organization will cope, cope better with, with, with problems if that happens. Southwest is really good at that. So Southwest um, rewards and informs its workforce in a way that when problems happen, people know about what needs to be done, so they identify the problem to be solved and they know how to work together, uh, and they have the information they need, or they know where to get it quickly, in order to address the problems before it happens. So when you when you see um, uh, 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 either television commercials or interviews about Southwest where they talk about what a fun place it is to work, that's true a lot of the time. But you know, sometimes it's not fun to work there. But that's because the, f- the times aren't particularly pleasant but they're not as stressful there than they are at other firms where there's a tendency not to reward for co- cooperation and to hold back information that would enable people to, that people actually need to solve, to solve the problem. And so, you know, the, the, um, the alternative to informing your workforce is rumor. It's not as if they'll be, they'll be, they'll just sort of go happily away, bl- blithely, um, uh, happy to be ignorant, they'll they'll create m- misleading information if right, you don't in give vacuum. in a vacuum. So actually, that reminds me of as you're talking about identifying problems and and not having that be viewed as a blame game, but being viewed as hey, here's an opportunity for a corrective action and for continuous improvement. That reminds me of the whole idea of total quality management and kaizen. Which, is it just me, or has that kind of gone out of fashion is not at the tip of people's minds these days? It's gone out of fashion. So, so, so th- that's kind of a shame, right? Because all of this, a lot of this, I think, culture can be created through a, a literally just utilizing a framework and a system of total quality management that can kind of facilitate this culture you're talking about. Total quality management is, ha- has many things to offer us that are very constructive and positive. But on its own, not enough. Okay. That's what that's what we've learned. But the thing is, it, ha- it seems like it's just fallen off the table. Uh, yes, uh, because you know um, we like variety as human beings. You know, you know, we want the new stuff. So it's old news. That's you know that's the issue, and and 
you know, I hate to be, I hate to sound cynical, but old right. news doesn't make money. Right. You know, so, yeah. you know, even, even repackaging old news but calling it new, that can make money. Right, exactly. <laughs> right. Uh, so it has, that, has to do, that has to do with a different kind of dynamic, I think. So are you serious? Do you, in, in uh, I'll grab the book here again, in uh, ending the management illusion, do you literally have a 12-step process for doing that? Okay. <laughs> or is that your next book you're, that you're uh, giving us a preview on? Uh, I, I talk about the 12 steps, but I don't, I don't describe a 12-step process. Uh, process. Okay. Uh, it, it's you know it's um, so you know the thing the thing about about um, these kinds of issues is that the twelve steps would vary from company to company and industry to industry. Uh, I I don't want to I do I don't didn't want in this t in this book to to lay out something that I thought might work for some but to lay it out as a general framework that I knew wouldn't work for lots of others, and so more important was to identify what the basic issues are that you would use as building blocks okay. to develop the culture uh, of, of, of a firm. And, and what, I, what I do at Santa Clara now, since the days that uh, you were, you were with, with me, Brett, <laughs> was... Uh, Back in those old days, I think they had uh, Flintstones. They didn't have cars and uh, engines and cars back then. <laughs> <laughs> and I had hair. <laughs> <laughs> and mine was not gray. <laughs> Uh, uh, so what I do now is, over the course of a term, I, uh, I have a simulation game where, where my students nice. run companies and, okay. com and compete with each other. And in the course of running these companies, what we do is we teach them how to build the cultures of their groups. Everybody, so the groups are, they share, they share responsibility for the company as a whole, but they're split along functional lines. So somebody handles operations, some marketing, some finance. They have to find a way to work together in order to build a culture of their, of their group slash company uh, in ways that are consistent with the sorts of principles that, 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 that I emphasize. They have to build their processes really carefully. They have to recognize explicitly what these psychological pitfalls are. They have to build into their processes. Everybody has to have processes. The question is, is how good are they in terms of addressing these potential pitfalls? Uh, so you build the, the, the decision culture of the organization so that uh, it's, it, it's healthy from, from, the, from the framework that's outlined in, in the book. Wow. And at the, and, you know, at the end of the course, you know, you've got a, a, a group of, of, of people who, who say, you know, this was a, li a capstone-like experience, but nothing like the actual capstone course that we take. Right, right. Because it's really about how you make decisions, but in a very broad sense. It's not about doing a case study of a firm to figure out its strategy. It's about, right, right. It's about how you would be the decision maker right. and doing it when you're emotionally engaged. Yes, exactly. It's not an intellectual exercise alone. So, so uh, it's um, uh, I do I do in the book talk about what I do in the course, okay. uh, but nowhere in the kind of detail that it would take to really see how how to how to get it how to get it. So a couple of questions for you. One is, what's the name of the course? Uh, the, uh, I teach um, the, the MBA version is called Finance, Accounting, and Behavioral Bias. And the undergraduate version of the course is called Open Book Management. Oh, very nice. I like, I like that one. Yeah. So uh, have you put any thought or effort into actually productizing this course in a larger, for a larger audience? Uh, I do think about that from time to time. Uh, certainly, um, you know, people can buy the book and read how it's done. And I make some of the instructional files available on my website for those who want to just download it and, and, and play with it. Um, uh, but I, uh, the next step, it, you know, I would say that now to teach this course, it takes me, personal, right, sure, you know. Sure, right. So to make it scalable, you have to call on yourself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or, uh, so I uh, and I actually have to think about how to how to how to clone myself intellectually. So well, I, I, I just to let you know, I brought along a little syringe. I'm going to be taking <laughs> DNA samples here in a minute. <laughs> Glad to oblige. <laughs> <laughs> Will you introduce us later? <laughs> uh, but
but but but I do think about how to do that in the works. And so if I if I can just carve out a little bit of time, uh, I would really think about what it would take to uh, to, to to make it a turnkey operation. Uh, and right, right. Now, you know, right now it's kind of more prototype in terms of that. So so in all a series of sort of wrapping up here, how can people, how can managers and executives get access to uh, these ideas and you know understand them and, and understand the, your framework and how they might need to make some changes in their organization? Uh, I think step one is probably to, to buy the book. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, uh, and, to, and to read it. Um, and the book mentions other books, the books written not, by, not necessarily by academics like me, but by business people who, who, who do things like, like open book management. Uh, and and have learned through the school of hard knocks, okay. you know how to build the cultures of the organization. Um, there are there you know there are seminars um, out in the in the real world that companies offer or consulting firms offer uh, that provide uh, a, a taste of what some of the steps are. But I think at this stage there isn't one go-to place where you get the the whole the whole perspective. Uh, but you can certainly get important pieces and I think that you don't want to let the perfect be the enemy of the good <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so you know there are places to that you can turn to for resources to, to figure out how, how, how to do it there's some wonderful books now uh, on, on behavioral on behavioral psychology that, that deal with this that deal with this issue um, uh, and I would say you know you know just go to a search engine of your choice and and type in behavioral decision making and and see what comes up there. Books like Drive, um, for example, that's a very good book uh, to figure out what motivates people. Um, there's, you know, how smart people can make dumb mistakes um, that deals with this kind of issues. There's a, a set of books written uh, out of Stanford by Chip Heath and his right. brother Heath and Heath that right. that that uh, talks about uh, cognitive repairs. What are the m mistakes we can make to our psyches to help us make better decisions? So so lot, lot, lots of lots of good things to uh, 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 you be able to access to a, to to answer the question that you asked. The excellent question, I might say. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. So the the book is Ending the Management Illusion by Hirsch Sheffern. Hirsch, where can we uh, find this book? Uh, uh, so online is probably the easiest way. So you can you'll you can uh, get a copy oftentimes by walking into a bookstore, you know, like uh, Barnes and Noble, for example, uh, or uh, Borders. Uh, but you never know with it's a hit and miss. But I I usually recommend people try online first to get okay, it in a couple great. days. And how can they uh, uh, find out more about you personally? Oh, so probably my website. Uh, so just go to a search engine, type in my name, and uh, what should pop up as number one or number two is my Santa Clara website. Okay. And uh, and uh, you know, click get there, and then you can go 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 from that. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed the conversation today, Dr. Sheffrin. Uh -huh. Thanks, Fred. It was great to see you again, and I, I had a good time as well. Thank you so much for having me on your program. You're so welcome. It's Brett Clay and Dr. Hirsch Sheffrin here at Santa Clara University. I'll see you next time. TheActuationZone.com, brought to you by ChangeLeadershipGroup.com. Copyright 2010, Brett Clay, All Rights Reserved.